So now you have choice. Choice is follow your purpose. Go straight and do what you, what you are meant to do. Or deviate from that path and go explore. Now, if you choose to go explore and deviate from your purpose, you go out, you explore the rest of the world, you learn a bunch of things, get into a bunch of new amazing experiences. But then you turn around and you go back and you follow your path. Now, if you just follow your path straight out, you get there, you have nothing. Every, the little bit that you learned on your journey, and that's all you have. But if you went out and you seen the entire world first, you got all these new experiences. You learned how to make a fire, how to build, how to do so many different things. You got a wife, you got kids, family, and you got all this stuff now, and you follow your path. Go to Antarctica. And now that you're there, you understand how to navigate. You understand about the cold. You have all this knowledge now that's going to help you understand how to deal with that element. Now you understand, well, wait a minute, if I explore this place further, I can go a little bit deeper and it's not all ice. It's actually a tropical park there. Now you have this information. So that's a different way of looking at it. The problem is with us, we don't know our path. We don't know it. We've been cut off completely from it. So it's one thing to know that your path is to go to Antarctica and you're just going to get all this experience first before you complete that goal. But the thing is, we have been cut off. We don't even know that we're supposed to go there. We've been told. We've been given rules. We've been given an alternate reality based upon choice to choose a bunch of other things other than other than our path. So we can't even follow it. And this is the situation that we are in. It's the same thing. So now it's the same thing in the Garden of Eden story. It's the same thing. You know, they're altered. They've been altered. Instead of us following that path, and put on this track that's taking us in this circle, this cycle, to keep us going around and around and around and around, away from our true path. So when you look at it in that aspect, you can say, well, wait a minute, maybe it's not so bad that we have this dualistic nature, this choice, because now we can have these new experiences, and it's experience that allows the consciousness to grow, plain and simple. Consciousness can grow in just nothingness. Even if, you know, your path was to go straight and not deviate from that path, you're not really going to learn nothing along that path because you only stayed on that path. But if you can step off that path and explore and come back to the path, as long as you don't lose your way, you understand what the path is. It's going to deviate, but I'm going to come back. And I'm going to have a new experience at every step of the way until I reach my goal. And this is the purpose. This is the thing. So I look at it in that aspect, you can say, well, wait a minute, this dualistic thing is not so bad. And thus, you see the dualistic nature of Satan and God. Not so bad. What you, what's going on? It's not so bad what Satan did, which is how the Gnostic look, look at it and how the Satanists look at it. It's not so bad what he did. We have this dualistic nature now where we can have these experiences. And if you're going to grow in consciousness and energy, you need to have this experience. And when you look at the ancients, they clearly did exactly that they created so much they understood the path but they had this experience where it was growing from it but they stayed on the path the ancient egyptians as well they had their systems they had their mystery schools they had everything that they was doing but they understood ma'at and based everything off of it truth so the garden of eden story is telling us exactly our situation we are in now Plain and simple. Adam and Eve represents both both hemispheres of the brain. It represents the separation of the higher and lower brain. They represent negative and uh, positive energy, Kundalini. They represent so much. The whole story, again, is talking about the brain. It's talking about us. It's alluding to our situation and alluding to our path and our creation story and what has taken place. All of that in the book of Genesis. And we ain't even finished yet. We ain't even finished with Genesis. In this video we are, but we'll get back in and into it in more DVDs, of course, because there's just so much more. But this is what it's talking about. That's what it's talking about. So, you know, when we uh, look at the brain, you have a lot of people uh, showing that the brain is a complex organism, very complex organism. You get back to the brain. 
get back to the Great Pyramid, which, as I said before, basically was a negative ion transmitter that basically made the Nile fertile. It also helped us, you know, regenerate our body as far as, you know, healing us ourselves and giving ourselves energy. So these negative ions basically amplified what meditation did for our body in the meditative state. So that when you're walking around normally, you got this rejuvenation, you got this healing, and then when you got into a meditative state, you just got it even faster. So it was this connection that we have to heal ourselves, to repair, which is why they had to destroy the pyramids, of course, which is why we see them in, you know, disrepair and destructive uh, uh, situations everywhere we see them all over the world, underwater or what have you. They, those had to go. And this is another reason why, one, because when you think about it, if this is the case and, you know, it is proven to be the case when meditation does heal, but you would have to think about how long you could live. Think about how long you would live if you could just keep healing. You get a cut, I go into meditation, I heal that fast. Or even if I don't meditate, it's going to heal fast. But meditation is going to cleanse. You don't have to worry about any kind of disease or sickness or what have you because you have this whole environment all around the world that's, you know, clothed in these negative ions that's healing. As I talked about in the Saturn Satan series, trees, hundreds of years, thousands of years in some cases. Why? Because they disperse negative ions. They heal themselves. They regenerate. Plain and simple. So when you get into the Bible, I mean, it's one of the reasons why. It's talking about, that's what it's alluding to, by the way. It's talking about how, you know, Moses and Abraham and all these people, how, how all these people lived to 900, 700, 200, 300 years. Hundreds of years they was living back then. This is what it's trying to tell you. It was different. It was different. So this is what, you know, the purpose of the pyramids was based upon my research and others as well. So when you look at an obelisk or a Tekken, and you look at the top of, you know, the obelisk, you see is the pyramid shape, you know, pyramid shape. And one, we have the temples. The temples is the body, even though it shows the head inside the temple, but it's alluding more to the body. And you have the pyramid, which would be the head, which is why you see this. You see the brain or the head inside of the pyramid. It's the capstone. That's why they call it the capstone, the cap, your head. It's on the top of the obelisk. You have even still the pyramid, but still a capstone trying to give you that hint. So you see the brain inside the uh, pyramid and it's trying to tell you something. So now we know the Great Pyramids, Khufu, Khafre, Menkerup align with the stars on Orion's belt. Now we also know in the Great Pyramid you have these openings in the King's Chamber and the Queen's Chamber. Now in the King's Chamber you have these openings that align with... Uh, the constellation of uh, Orion and aligns with Sirius. This is where the Greeks got the name Osiris from. You have Orion, you have Sirius, and they just you know gave us Osiris. Now, when you look at these alignments, you look at the Queen's Chamber, you see it aligns with the constellation Draco. Again, you have the pyramid talking about the brain. This is why the brain is there. As I just said, the Adam and Eve story is about the brain. So you have the queen's chamber, the woman Eve, aligning with Draco, which is why Eve is the one that dealt with the serpent, the serpent dragon, uh, Draco, which is why Eve is the one who dealt with the serpent because of this alignment. So again, remember they call the serpent the dragon, they call uh, Satan the dragon and the serpent as well. This is why Draco is the serpent dragon. So when you look at that, you can understand where they got this comparison from. So when we look at the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis, Genesis is about the beginning, as I said. Now, when you understand about the whole area in Giza and what the Egyptians talked about, about the first time, all that stuff is dealing with the first time, what the Egyptians called the Zeptepi, meaning the first time. It's the same thing. Adds up exactly with the Adam and Eve story, which adds up with the, I should say, the Egyptian mythology, but this is what it's talking about. So again, you have the body being the temples in ancient Egypt. You have the head, the brain being the pyramids themselves. And when you think about, as I said, how the pyramids dispersing these negative ions would basically heal the body. And when, when you think about it that way, it would be the brain, the consciousness that is basically going to be healing the body. 
it's going to be where the energy is going to be coming from. So this is why the pyramids having this uh, representation of healing and having this function of dispersing these negative ions to heal the body is symbolizing exactly what the brain is going to do. So when you go in meditation and you meditate to heal the body, to cleanse the body, this is what the pyramids was exactly supposed to do the same way, same representation of the brain, plain and simple. Again, <laughs> when you start understanding the stuff and putting it together, I mean, everything jumps out at you. It's just there for you to just take it right in. So now when you talk about consciousness creating energy, energy creating matter, you know, you have to think about what would be the highest form of energy. I mean, what would that be? And when you think about the pyramids aligning with the stars on Orion's belt and the fascination with the star constellation Sirius, which is where our sun sits in uh, that Sirius, that, uh, that area, it's the sun. The sun is the highest form of energy that we can think of. It's the highest form. You know, the sun powers, you know, so much. And it's the highest form of energy you can equate on a materialistic level as pertaining to our energy. So you have the sun, which would be the highest form of physical energy that we can see, plain and simple. No matter what sun you're talking about, we're talking about the sun. Our energy is unseen. It's unseen. We can't see it. So to compare it to anything, as far as what we are, as far as infinite energy, the only thing you can compare it to is the sun. So you have to understand there are there's unseen energy. So there is an aspect of the sun that we cannot comprehend in this physical form, that we can't comprehend on this physical level. It's something that the ancient Egyptians are alluding to, and I'm giving away a lot. <clears throat> by the way, excuse me, but we'll get into it down the line. It's something that they're heading to to tell you this. Plain and simple. There's a higher form. There's more to the sun that meets the eyes, more to it. And the only thing that we can express to, the only way we can convey what we are energy-wise is to compare it to the sun, which gives everything life here on this planet, no matter how you want to slice it. But... If the sun was gone, our, our energy would still remain, which tells you something about us. So now, when you think about that, and you think about how Osiris is compared to Sirius, and compared with Orion, and uh, the afterlife and everything like that, you begin to understand you know, what it's talking about. So when you look at the uh, pyramid text, you look at uh, uh, spell 466, it's saying, the king becomes a star, utterance 466. Again, one of many states, O king, you are this great star, companion of Orion, who traverses the sky with Orion, who navigates the netherworld with Osiris. You ascend from the east of the sky, being renewed in your due season and rejuvenated at your due time. So Osiris becoming a star, becoming the highest form of energy, which is basically what you will become You know, when you die. Like you say in Star Wars, you strike me down, I'll become more powerful than you can ever imagine. I will become a sun. I will become like a sun. I will have you know, endless, infinite energy is what it's talking about. So when you look at the pyramid, when you understand that it's pertaining to the brain, as I said, and that we're talking about the uh, Adam and Eve story, Genesis, pertaining to the brain. All this stuff is talking about the brain because it's going to be the brain and the body that's going to allow you to basically, you know, activate the third eye to basically join uh, Osiris. So when you understand again, the Zeptepi, meaning the beginning, the first time, and Genesis talking about the first time, you know, this is what all this stuff is alluding to. So when you think about the first time, and one of the ancient Egyptian uh, mystery uh, mythologies, uh, when you understand the story, you know, in the first time you have eventually Osiris, Isis, you have uh, Set and uh, Nephis come down to Earth and be like, you know, sort of the first people here, the first rulers, so to speak, which will be Asar and uh, you know, Aset. So we know the story. So we know, you know, after Isis basically 
find all 13 pieces and put them together. She becomes pregnant and she, you know, have, gives birth to Horace, which Horace will kind of sort of be like the first line of kings, so to speak, which is why all the rulers uh, in the dynasties, all the rulers of Egypt call themselves the living Horus because they believe they are from the consciousness of Horus, the same consciousness of Horus, which kept reincarnating, reincarnating, creating all these kings, creating all these bloodlines and that, you know, it all goes back there. So basically when you uh, make the right connections and you unite, you know, and you become fully conscious and awaken the third eye, what have you, you go from the living Horus being the first, uh, you know, human or first uh, line of the king, so to speak. And then you die, you become the Osiris, which is Osiris being the, the ruler of the underworld, which is, as I talked about in the uh, Egyptian Book of the Dead DVD, about how you see this a lot. You see Osiris and then the person's name, Osiris Annie, you know, Osiris Soker, or Soker Osiris. You see a lot of the uh, pharaohs at death have the combination Osiris added to their name, alluding you know, to them being dead and being with Osiris. This is why all this stuff was being was there, was put there. So you have it all, you know, pertaining to the brain. So you have to understand, uh, you know, what the ancient Egyptians' dreams must have been like to have that kind of clarity, not be bombarded with television and all the stuff that, you know, we have to deal with. When you look in front of the Sphinx, you have a stella there called the Dream Stella, put there by Thutmose the Fourth. Now, the Dream Stella is supposed to be talking about Thutmose and basically uh, the Sphinx telling him that he would, you know, one day rule. All he had to do was basically clear away the sand from around the Sphinx, which that in itself tells a lot about Egypt and how old it really is. You know, uh, I think Thutmose dates, you know, way back to the 14th century, I believe, BCE. So, if it was sand covering the Sphinx, then, I mean, it's old. And uh, that happened a few times, I believe. But you got to think that if Egypt is intact, somebody's clearing away the sand. Now, Thutmose the Fourth had intense spiritual visions. A lot of people believe he was connected, talked about speaking to the ancestors, and he was connected, you know, to the energy. And it's one of those things you got to think about. How did the Egyptians know? How did they know? That's why I say their dreams had to be completely different. How did they know to to go to Kemet after all that destruction and everything that happened? As I said, those pyramids was there, but they knew somehow to go to Egypt and that was their goal. They just followed that path and kept going north until they got there. And when they got there, they already knew kind of sort of what was going on. And they already kind of sort of followed, you know, these unbelievable practices that, you know, you know, still sort of exist today that we try to copy off. And we still are not up to par as they were so long ago. But that most of fourth had these severe, you know, extreme psychic visions and everything like that. He died of an extreme case of epilepsy. And it's something that a lot of pharaohs died from, believe it or not, uh, epilepsy. And that most of fourth actually exists. We, we actually have his body, Valley of Kings, you know, by the way, his body. We still have it as well as other pharaohs as well. So these people existed. But it's interesting that, you know, uh, when they did the autopsy on his body, they found that, you know, he suffered from epilepsy and that he, as a lot of people talk about, about him, had these extreme, uh, you know, psychic visions or what have you. But, you know, it's amazing when you start getting into the story and looking at everything that it pertains to and see how it all corresponds with the brain and correspond with a lot of these biblical stories that we're hearing. This is just Genesis, people. We can go through that whole book, all 66 books, and find so many things that we can go back to Egypt. We can go back to Mesopotamia. We can go back to um, uh, India, we can go back to Asia and find a lot of these things that's in the Bible that's pertaining to a lot of stories. So you have the Zeptepi, you have the alignment of the sun, you have the alignment of the uh, uh, Nile with the Milky Way and the stars on Orion's belt with the pyramids. That alignment we find in a lot of monuments around the world. Asian monuments, Indian monuments, we find the same alignment symbolizing that they knew something about that time. Again, if a lot of you seen a lot of the, the specials that people put out there about the pyramids, they talk about this stuff. And they talk about how 10,500 years ago, you had this alignment in the East, which is 
in uh, Utterance 466 that was talking about Osiris, you know, rising in the east because during that time is when the, the sun rose in the east. And you got to wait, I believe, to the spring equinox to see it rise in the east again. And um, it's all there. It's all there, which is why they got to keep Kemet sort of intact and, you know, they're trying to preserve it. But if you know what to follow and look for in the monuments and understanding the body, understanding the Bible and understanding, you know, Egyptian you know, mythology, then you can start to put these pieces together. So you got to think about, you know, the ancient Egyptians, the ancestors and, the, you know, the consciousness that existed in them during that time and what possibly happened. We don't know how big the gap is we just don't know we don't know how big the gap is from when whatever civilization was on this planet fell versus the time it took for us to to come back for somebody to you know and and that's sort of what genesis is alluding to to you know these people was here they did whatever and then it's there this it's there this gap and in this gap you could say that we were altered humans were altered and was changed we have this you know bone in our brain now separating our brain we have this altered DNA, this recoded DNA to basically scramble or hinder us from understanding our true path and connecting to, uh, to our true power, you know, our, our true purpose, you know, so to speak. So, you know, just think about, you know, if you are infinite energy, consciousness, you know, traveling the cosmos for millennia, that's all you know, and you happen to come into physical existence the only thing that you can reflect is the cosmos itself, because that's all you know. It's the only thing you can reflect. So when we see them reflecting the you know, cosmos, the um, constellations, and everything that they did, you know, you know, on the planet, you know, all the monuments of what have you, how they reflected, you know, as above, so below, you know, it's what they knew. That's what they knew. And when they understood the body, understood themselves, and understood that it's the same as the universe, they did the body. They understood the brain, they did the brain. They understood what was going on. It's what they knew. To what purpose, for what point? There's a lot more to it that we got to get into. So, you know, again, when you understand that the key to figuring all this stuff out and to accessing your true power, true purpose, is knowledge. As I said, you can understand why they hinder us why everything is the way that it is while we are in this position because it's for them to stop us from reaching full potential from disturbing their plan plain and simple we are on their time we are under their time under their control so in order for you to create time as i was trying to allude to before in order for time to exist itself the creator of time has to have a purpose for it. As I said before, somebody walked into your house and said, hey, how long is it going to take you to finish eating? Why? Why? It has to be a reason. If you didn't care about or had a purpose or had something to do that's corresponding to me eating at this moment, you wouldn't be asking. Why? How long? How long? The time. So we understand time is a construct of duality, of a dual nature. And it that dual nature of time is deviating you from a purpose. And the evil part of that purpose is dealing with the agenda of the person who instilled the time. For us in our reality, it's normal because, of, like I said, if a person say, hey, you need to be here by six, it's because they need that time to do whatever they got to do to get stuff ready. And you are now on their time. Time is a construct. We are all under it. We all suffer from it. It is something that we are dealing with. But when you start looking back at the stories and understanding how they pertain to our physical reality and how so much that we see is trying to tell us something so that we understand it, you know, what is that? <laughs> and, and one of the things we look at it and we say it's them, you know, is it them trying to convey the story to teach it to others? in esoteric circles, or is it something else? And I always tell people, as I said before, when you see the numbers and everything, it's something telling you, you're on the right path, you're going in the right direction, stay on that path, keep doing what you're doing. And it's giving you the, you know, the understanding that you're following your purpose and what you need to do to get to the true purpose that, you know, you need to follow. So 
and looking at you know consciousness and everything like that and what's going on and understanding the implications of it all you know as i said before you know getting this experience is a good thing having this experience versus traveling the cosmos for millions of years and not having no experience and not being able to create what you want. Now, being here in its physical form, going through life so many times and getting all these experience, we see that reflected in the dream world. We see it projected. And we see in a dream world that it's so many different scenarios. So in the dream state, multiple dreams that you have, different things happen, things that's beyond your control because your subconscious is controlling it. But imagine if that's what death is like, but you are in control. The infinite experience that you have and the so many dreams that you have throughout your lifetime, you can create, you can explore, you can create the reality. As I said before, you gotta think about how your subconscious can project the real world into your dream world. How you can just doze off and go to sleep and be dreaming about something completely detailed and real, seemingly, and really think that you're there. There, Your consciousness has that knowledge. You have the knowledge of time. You have the knowledge of all existence within you. So if you think about fulfilling your purpose and going on and having the ability to create whatever you want. You have the experience now. If you want to go back and live in the 70s or 60s, you can make it happen, <laughs> so to speak. You know, you can make whatever happened happen. Or you could choose to send back some of your energy here to go through the experience again and to grow further in consciousness. You know, this goes into that whole higher self thing, speaking to your higher self. And I'm not talking about something spooky as far as like you actually talking to another physical person. It's you. So it will be as if it's your own thoughts and your own feelings as far as something giving you uh, inspiration to move in a certain way, to do certain things. You know, it would feel just normal because it's you. So, you know, you got to look at all this stuff and take it out of the spooky realm, spooky realm and understand that this is what it is. It's possible. This is what it's talking to. But we fell, you know, so far in consciousness. And um, we have this dual nature that is not 100% a bad thing. And probably was done for a purpose. The problem is now it was done and Sutton took advantage of that situation and is now hindering us from, you know, completing our true purpose and from taking the experience that we have accumulated in these lifetimes and jumping back on that path and following our purpose. And this is what we're seeing. So this was Mystery School 4. And this is what I wanted to get into. A lot of information, a lot more to come. And um, I want you to understand the importance of meditation again, which meditation too will be out soon. We'll get into it a lot more. Give you a quick example. And I used to get mad at this when I was first um, getting into this meditation stuff. But I remember, you know, just eight, you get tired, you start dozing off, you know, or watching TV or reading a book. But then I would doze off and have like a little, you had one of those little mini dreams and then you wake up, but I would have these little mini dreams about like cats fighting or something like that. And I would wake up out of it and be like, what the fuck? You know, what was that? And I would get mad, like, why did I have this stupid little dream about cats? Or I would doze off and have this little small dream about something stupid and small that I'm like, what was that? You know, and I remember I used to have dreams that just made absolutely no sense. And, you know, 11, 12 years of meditation started to clear that up. And, you know, when you start getting into the dream consciously and then meditating in that dream and understanding uh, where you're going and what you're seeing. And then when, when you wake up trying to dif differentiate that from reality, is this the future that I saw? What, what was that? Because it's tough to start figuring it out when stuff seems so real. And it, it gets confusing, confusing sometimes. Because then you have these dreams that seem so real. And then, you know, you wake up and you go about your, your life or what have you. And they'll seem like memories. They'll seem like something that actually happened. And then it'll be tough for you to, you know, to say, well, did that really happen? Was that a dream? You start falling, you know, into these kind of patterns, you know. But meditation, again, will help you with that. And as you grow and start educating yourself more 
everything and pan itself out. So, you know, it's it's a lot. As I always say, a lot more information, a lot more to go. Uh, I want to thank you guys for taking the time to watch, purchase, and support. And um, yeah, you know, new video on YouTube now, as you've probably seen, uh, a lot more to come. But again, you know, the body is important for you to build, build the mind and everything and understand uh, what they're trying to keep you away from and understand what all this stuff is about. Remember, in the scheme of things, when you think about what you just watched and listened to in this video, in the scheme of things, when you look at what they're talking about and arguing about in the street, it seems stupid, right? Don't it seem like something that somebody would put in your path to hinder you from your purpose, arguing about this race, black, white, stupid shit? That only they're benefiting from. You're not. You're getting so frustrated and mad about something that in the scheme of it all has absolutely no major point. Regardless, you gotta grow. You gotta develop body, mind, plain and simple. Don't let that stuff bother you. Don't let it bother you. You are so much better than that. Don't let it get to you. It's a people who have a nature that is contradictory to ours, but only by design, only because the leaders made it that way. Would have been real easy to create unity, but they chose not to. And we got to deal with that now. So, you know, don't let it bother you too much. Move forward, grow, learn. So again, thank you guys for taking the time to watch and purchase. Uh, thanks to everybody who supported. I spoke about at the end of that video about what I'm trying to do as far as what the GoFundMe was about. So if you donate it, I appreciate it. Thanks for that. And uh, thanks for, you know, believing in what I'm trying to do. And, um, yeah, I really appreciate the support. But, you know, already planning the next trips, planning another trip to Kemet next year and a bunch of other places. You'll see, again, follow me, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and, uh, you know, get updates about a lot of things on email. And I always put things on Instagram as well and Facebook. So you'll see all that at The Real Merkaba. And, uh, yeah, thank you guys again. See you next video.